And good evening and welcome to the Town of Cary's Planning and Zoning Board meeting for July the 26th. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are streaming tonight's meeting virtually. All board members, staff members, and applicants are participating remotely. While this is a public meeting, please be aware this is not a public hearing. There is no opportunity for the public to speak during this meeting. If you have comments about any of these cases, we encourage you to reach out to the staff case manager or the applicant by email or phone. You may reach out to our board members through email. You may also contact council directly through email or through the public speaks out portion of any regularly scheduled town council meeting. Because we are remote meeting remotely, I will call on each board member individually to confirm their attendance at this meeting. All motions, seconds, and votes will be verbally obtained. So the first item on our agenda is roll call. And let's see, I will call on each of you and state if you are present. Don Hamilton. Present. Nicole Samuel. Present. Mary Jo Hill. Present. Chuck Montgomery. Chuck. Mr. Montgomery is not present at the current time. Steve Crutchfield. Present. Jessica Pearson. Present. John Sorrell. Present. Jessica McClure. Present. And I, Dan McFarland, am in attendance as well. The second item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. The applicant for agenda item C1, which is case 21 REZ01 to the Tower View Court PDD and Act 19 Comprehensive Plan Amendment, has requested for their case to be considered first on the agenda due to the applicant's attorney having a scheduling conflict for later this evening. So, with that in mind and with that uh, adjustment to the agenda, is there a motion to adopt the revised agenda? Make a motion to approve the revised agenda. And a second. I'll second. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second and a roll call. I'll call on each of you to state your vote. Don Hamilton. Aye. Nicole Samuel. Aye. Mary Jo Hill. Aye. Is Mr. Montgomery with us yet? All right, moving on. Steve Crutchfield. Aye. Jessica Pearson. Aye. John Sorrell. Aye. And Jessica McClure. Aye. And I vote aye as well. It passes unanimously. Now, moving on to approval of the regular minutes. Is there a motion to approve the May 24th meeting minutes? I move we approve the May 24 meeting minutes. Thank you, Mary Jo. Is there a second? I second. This is Jessica Pearson. Thank you, Jessica. Again, once again, roll call. I'll call on each of you. Don Hamilton. Aye. Nicole Samuel, please. Aye. Mary Jo Hill. Aye. Steve Crutchfield. Aye. Jessica Pearson. Aye. John Sorrell. Aye. Jessica McClure. Aye. And I vote in the affirmative as well. Passes unanimously. So moving on to our cases this evening. The first case is 21 REZ, the Tower View Court PDD rezoning, and is also an associated Act 19 Comprehensive Plan Amendment. And Associate Planning Director Deborah Grannon will share the staff's presentation. Following the presentation, the applicant will share their remarks. All board members will have an opportunity to ask questions of the staff and applicant. Ms. Grannon, you may proceed. Ms. Grannon, I believe you're muted. Thank you, Chairman and board members. Um, for your consideration this evening is a request to rezone approximately 26 acres located at 330 Tower View Court. This is also an opportunity for you to consider an amendment to the future growth framework map of the Imagine Carry Community Plan. The subject property is located at the terminus of Tower View Court and has frontage along James Jackson Avenue. The site is also located east of Northwest Carry Parkway. 
Preston Walk Development is opposite the site south of James Jackson Avenue, and Preston East Industrial Park is located to the north and the west. The property is currently zoned industrial, which is shown in dark purple. And that's the same designation for most of the parcels on Tower View Court. There's a couple of properties zoned office research and development east of the site, and the Preston Walk development is zoned general commercial conditional use. West of Cary Parkway, where there's no colored shading, means that the property does not have Cary zoning because it's located in Morrisville. The land north of the site and the strip between the site and Cary Parkway has a Morrisville zoning designation of office and institutional. A Morrisville zoning designation of high density and low density residential applies to properties on the west side of Northwest Cary Parkway. And as you may know, the site is currently the site of five radio towers, which up until now has limited the opportunities to consider development of this property. The applicant has proposed planned development district major. The PDD zoning district is an opportunity for applicants to propose innovative design options that might not otherwise be allowed under Cary's land development ordinance. And in return for the quality design and the innovation, they may propose flexibility to certain LDO standards, such as density, building height, and buffer performance. The planned development district that was submitted by the applicant depicts buildings and parking areas in orange and yellow and streetscapes and buffers in green. For a planned development district to be considered, it must contain a mix of uses. The PDD proposes up to 560 residential dwelling units comprised of 130 townhouses and 430 residential multifamily units. The PDD would entitle up to 10,000 square feet of commercial use. However, no minimum commitment to a non-residential use has been guaranteed by the applicant. If commercial use is proposed, the PDD limits uses to retail, convenience store, restaurant, financial institution, assembly, and personal service. The plan includes approximately four acres total of open space, and this includes regulatory open space for buffers and community gathering spaces. Other design standards include increasing the multifamily building height from 35 feet to 65 feet, increasing townhouse building height from 35 feet to 50 feet, providing multifamily parking at a rate of 0 0.97 spaces per bedroom, no reduction to parking rates for townhouses or any portion of the non-residential uses are proposed. Along the western portion of the northern perimeter buffer, the applicant has requested a buffer width of 30 feet. The typical LDO standard here would be 50 feet. In order to the, I'm sorry, um, along the site's northern perimeter buffer, the applicant is proposing to install berms at a height of two to six feet in height, and this is to help provide transitions to the adjacent use. The LDO height limit is typically four feet. The applicant has also committed to planting supplemental landscape in the northern perimeter buffer between the townhouse tract and the industrial zoning to the north. The applicant seeks approval to allow some clearing and grading in the streetscape buffer along James Jackson Avenue. Specifically, they wish to allow buffer clearing and grading for a portion of the James Jackson Avenue streetscape to deal with topography challenges and to accommodate stairs and fences. And at site entrances, the applicant asks to clear and grade up to 20 feet on either side of the entrance. One of the most significant modifications or innovative design standards proposed by the applicant is something that we've not seen in Cary previously. And this is to design the site 
with townhome units fronting a courtyard or a promenade area in lieu of fronting a local townhome street. The PDD included this conceptual drawing to demonstrate how the courtyard design might be used and makes a commitment when that courtyard design is used to an average courtyard width of 35 feet. The applicant is also seeking flexibility for up to 15 townhome units to allow them to front on open space or a perimeter buffer in lieu of a local townhome street. An example from the development plan currently in review is shown here. So in those cases where it does not front a promenade or a courtyard, the perimeter buffer would be a minimum of 50 feet in width. Architectural commitments include providing 50% masonry on facades fronting James Jackson Ave Avenue and prohibiting vinyl siding. For the multifamily buildings, the applicant commits to breaking up roof lines with elements such as gables, hip roofs, and dormers. The applicant has proposed open space, uh, a maximum and minimum of four acres, and this includes wetlands, riparian buffers, perimeter and streetscape buffers, as well as community gathering space. Um, they've proposed um, to double the requirement of 5,000 square feet of community gathering space to 10,000 square feet. They've committed that all courtyard areas shall have sidewalks and landscaping, and that courtyard areas shall also have at least two features from a list of hardscape and landscape elements that are detailed in your staff report. A traffic study evaluated 13 intersections within one mile of the site and identified improvement opportunities at Chapel Hill Road and Maynard and Cary Parkway. While the applicant has not, not offered to make any offsite improvements, they have made commitments to provide improvements at each of the site's entrances. The Tower View PDD proposes improvements to site access points, including a dedicated left turn lane on James Jackson Avenue and Darrington Drive, a dedicated turn lane at Grisdale Lane, and installation of a traffic calming feature leading into the site on Tower View Court. According to Kerry's most recent GIS maps, the site is impacted by stream buffers and field determination of such features shall be required at the time of development plan review. Carries Parks Recreation and Cultural Resources Facilities map shows proposed greenways and street side trails in the vicinity of the site, but not actually located on the subject property. James Jackson Avenue is designated as a collector avenue on our transportation plan. There is a Go Carry Route 7 currently serving James Jackson Avenue and Northwest Carry Parkway, and that includes a stop directly in front of the subject property. And there are not any existing or proposed transit routes. I'm sorry, that's a hidden slide. That's not correct. Um, Town of Carry staff facilitated a virtual neighborhood meeting on March 3rd. 15 people attended. They expressed concerns about the site, uh, site access and circulation, for example, they wanted to know if Tower View Court would connect to the site. There was concern about traffic impacts, visibility of units from nearby businesses, walkability, stormwater, and the potential impact of new housing on nearby schools. We received several emails following the neighborhood meeting, uh, primarily with concerns related to traffic. On May 27th, the Town Council held a public hearing on the proposal, and there were no speakers at the Council public hearing and we have not received any additional correspondence since then. Following the public hearing, the town council members had questions and provided feedback to the applicant. Regarding use and density, the council expressed a preference for more townhouses and less residential multifamily. There were concerns about the proposed reduction in the minimum lot width for townhouses. One member questioned the need and appropriateness of a drive-through use on the site and one member suggested that a modest reduction in density would allow the development to better fit on the site. In terms of appearance, the council expressed concern about aesthetics, proposed modifications to building height and buffer reductions, and they asked for more information regarding the proposed promenade courtyard design. The council also asked 
about the proposed grading at James Jackson entrances and what that would look like and questioned why the proposal does not include a guarantee that the towers will be removed. The council also expressed concerns about the absence of any offsite vehicular or pedestrian improvements to help mitigate impacts and questioned if electric vehicle charging stations were proposed. Since the public hearing, the applicant has proposed to drop the requested reduction in the townhouse lot width. And so instead of the requested 16 feet, they're back to the standard of 20 feet. They've also added a guarantee regarding removal of the existing radio towers and the applicant has removed the drive through use from the list of permitted uses. The applicants also added commitments to provide pedestrian connections on James Jackson Avenue between the site and the existing Preston Walk shopping area to the south. The applicant has also provided commitments to provide multiple pedestrian improvements at the intersection of Northwest Curie Parkway and James Jackson Avenue including replacing the existing northern and eastern striped crosswalks with high visibility crosswalks since they're part of a larger greenway network, adding striped crosswalks and pedestrian activated signals on the western and southern legs of the intersection where there are none today, um, adding the missing ramp in the southwest quadrant of the intersection and upgrading the curb ramps to meet ADA requirements. In addition, the applicant added a commitment to provide two electric vehicle charging stations. So one of the advantages of the Imagine and Carry Community Plan is that it provides flexibility to evaluate a rezoning based on consistency with multiple policies rather than just a parcel based land use plan. But there's still the need to make sure that there's consistency between the proposal and the future growth framework map. So since this current proposal is not consistent with the land use on that map, this case includes a comprehensive plan amendment for your consideration. The existing future growth framework map designates the site as business industrial park. And there's a reason for that. Uh, when the Imagine Carry Community Plan was developed back in 2017, we considered the existing radio towers and the proximity of the site to the Preston East Industrial Park. And such a designation made sense given those existing conditions and that it would not really be consistent with proposed residential uses. So the staff report provides an analysis of the various categories that we considered when determining what land use would be consistent with this PDD proposal. So since this is predominantly residential, uh, the multifamily use is placed on the periphery of the site adjacent to thoroughfares. And because even though there's an offer of uh, potential for non-residential use, there's no guarantee of a commercial use. Staff identified traditional neighborhood as the most appropriate designation for the proposal. So because this case includes both the comprehensive plan amendment and the rezoning, we broke our analysis into two parts. So starting with the comprehensive plan, the L LDO states that proposals to amend a comp plan shall be evaluated based on whether the amendment is necessary to address certain conditions. And in this case, that would include a change in projections or assumptions from those on which the comprehensive plan is based or the identification of new issues, needs, or opportunities not adequately addressed by the plan. So as I mentioned, when the Curie Community Plan was adopted, we assumed the towers were likely going to be there for the lifespan of the plan. And then with this proposal, a fundamental change in that assumption has occurred. Also, high density residential is commonly located adjacent to commercial and office development. So the proposed change in use could be viewed as an opportunity for this land to be used alternatively for residential use. That change could provide housing opportunities to residents and support existing nearby commercial uses. So on balance, staff believes that the case can be made that a fundamental change in assumptions has occurred and that a new opportunity exists. In regard to the proposed zoning, um, our preliminary analysis of the Imagine Curry Community Plan finds that policies in the live, work, shape, and move chapters apply. The request provides more housing for residents, 
creates residential opportunities in new neighborhoods and adds an underrepresented re residential multifamily housing type that could provide balance and complement other residential uses in both Cary and Morrisville. And the proposal also supports redevelopment of this existing telecommunication facility. When we look at the work chapter, we find the request consistent with these policies if we put focus on workers and the workforce rather than the potential for a business to be located on the site. The site is near multiple employment and commercial centers, Preston, Park West, uh, Maynard Crossing are within one mile, uh, Weston, Harrison Point, downtown Cary are within two miles of the site. So this provision of ample housing and different housing types near employment areas helps grow and sustain a workforce while serving as a key component for enhancing locational needs and appeal to both businesses and to workers. Regarding the serve chapter, with proximity to existing businesses, the length of length of vehicular trips for shopping and services could be reduced and walking and biking might be practical. Uh, with a density of 21.5 units per acre, this proposal puts high density development in close proximity to existing commercial uses. And so it could support focusing more intense development in a strategic location. With transitions, the berms and increased plantings for the northern portion adjacent to the townhouse tract meet the policy of providing appropriate transitions. But there's also the multifamily tract on the western portion of the property that's accompanied by a request to reduce the buffer from 50 feet to 30 feet. Um, so that portion of the site might fall short of meeting the transitional goals. Regarding the move chapter, the applicant is proposing increased mobility choices for the proposed residential neighborhood by providing a pedestrian crossing on James Jackson Avenue and making multiple pedestrian improvements at James Jackson Avenue and Northwest Cary Parkway. And as I mentioned, they'll also be looking at traffic calming where Tower View comes into the site. So in our preliminary analysis, staff finds that the request is consistent with multiple policies in the live, work, shape, and move chapters of the Imagine Cary Community Plan. So with, as the board ponders this request and takes it into consideration, um, some of the questions that uh, come to mind are whether or not the proposed removal of the towers represents a change in the plan's assumptions and introduces opportunities not adequately addressed in the plan. And if so, is the proposed traditional neighborhood designation appropriate for the future growth framework map? And then is the proposed rezoning consistent with the Imagine Cary Community Plan policies from the work shape and move chapters and live chapters um, as it would be amended by the Act 19 amendment. Um, so when it comes time to vote on the rezoning, um, you know, you're going to vote on the rezoning, assuming that the comprehensive plan is approved. And as part of this vote, Remember that the Planning and Zoning Board votes on the rezoning based on its consistency with the plan and consistency with the future growth framework map. That's just one piece of the overall analysis. So this concludes staff's fairly lengthy presentation. Thank you for your patience. This is a complex case. Um, and the applicant's representative, Jamie Schwadler with Parker Poe is available. She's gonna provide an overview of the request and then following her comments, both she and I will be available for your questions. Ms. Schwedler, you may begin. Thank you, Ms. Grannon. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I'm Jamie Schwedler with Parker Poe at 31 Fayetteville Street here on behalf of the applicant floor development. On the line and available for questions, our representatives are representatives of our team, including Duncan Jones with Ackridge and Pam Tyrell with Kettler, Ed Tang and Travis Fluitt. Many of you know this site today, as Ms. Grannon mentioned, as the, an area between Preston Walk and the former O2 Fitness, home to five large, massive um, AM radio towers along James Jackson Avenue, highly visible as you drive over the bridge on Cary Parkway. The towers have been in place for almost three decades and are subject to a 100-year lease. 
But last, late last year, the opportunity um, for the removal of those towers became available, and along with it, the potential to transform this fourth corner of the Cary Parkway James Jackson intersection um, into a mixed use site that will provide needed housing and support this area. This transformation is important to the landscape Preston and what began as their vision for a high quality has now become not only synonymous with that level of quality, but also this area of town. That led them to seek a development team who could echo that vision into the neighborhood here but in a way that reflects our current needs and still maintains that high level of quality. Uh, I appreciate Ms. Grannon's summary of the changes. She did a great job in summarizing. I'll try to just hit three key areas, how we are adding a complementary use, our commitments to open space, and how the new promenade concept um, can be a unique add uh, to Carrie's uh, housing stock. First, um, the mix of uses offered here is an appropriate mix of uses uh, at this site because it complements the existing surrounding neighborhoods as well as the established commercial centers. And as Ms. Grannon noted, the majority of the surrounding residential product is single family to the southwest with the Preston Grand Villas uh, townhomes across Perry, uh, uh, across Carey Parkway to the Green. And the site is immediately south of the shops at, Walk, excuse me, north of the, the shops at Preston Walk and less than a quarter mile from the newer and larger Park West Village Shopping Center in Morrisville to the north. So adding additional co uh, commercial here has significant competition challenges and scale challenges. And because the size and proximities of these centers, we're offering the option of commercial use, but doing it at a, at a scale of square feet that's appropriate and can complement these centers. Um, and if placed here, that use can include or retail uses as Ms. Grannon summarized. We have a different type of housing product that's existing in the area and new residents New residents to be within walking distance of these established centers consistent with policy 2 of the live chapter and policy 3 of the shape chapter. The removal of the towers is all consi also consistent with policy 5 uh, of the live chapter, encouraging redevelopment of infill sites. Second, as shown on the screen, the multifamily district is to the left of your screen and the um, townhome tract is to the right shown in yellow. We've committed significant amounts of open space, uh, a total of four acres of open space, which consists of both the required elements and the voluntary elements, such as courtyards and promenade areas, that Ms. Grannon noted. That voluntary portion is committed to be at least 60,000 square feet, about three acres of those are overall four. And that's significant because most of the existing on the site is at that periphery of the edges of the site. And so we're committing to to preserve preserve those areas where we can. The 10,000 square foot of community Ms. gathering Whaler. area offered. Ms. Whaler, this yes. is Katie Driving Clark. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, your audio is breaking up just a bit. May I suggest that you turn okay. your video off and that could help with the audio quality? Sure. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I also wanted to let no. the chair know that it looks like board member um, Chuck Montgomery has joined us as well. Thank you, Katie. Is that better? Thank you. That sounds much better. Yes. Okay. Um, we're offering 10,000 square feet of community gathering area, which is over twice the amount required by the LDO and committing to the 50 foot type A perimeter buffer to the east side of Tower View Court where the townhomes are. And the reason we're doing that is because that's the area that's closest to the existing industrial zoning that will help screen that industrial use from the future townhome residents and adding that uh, berm area in uh, on the east side. We are reducing or requesting to reduce the um, type A perimeter buffer on the west side of Tower View from 50 feet down to 30, but we're also adding a two to five foot berm for at least 500 feet of the length within that shaded area. And although this area is technically adjacent to industrial zoning, that site contains the former O2 fitness facility, which sits back 100 feet from the property line is used as an office building today and is separated from the site by a stormwater pond and surface parking. So additional protection and transition is already available here in a site that's not likely to redevelop with a building closer to the property line. Um, and third, we're committing to design aspects, including the promenade concept that make this project unique. Our architectural commitments include 50% of the building facades fronting James Jackson Avenue would be comprised of a pallet of brick, stone, and other high quality materials, both for the multifamily and the townhome product, which exceeds the CAM requirements. 
final siding is prohibited with some exceptions. And the multifamily buildings have a commitment to avoid long roof lines by incorporating changes in height and form. The townhouses uh, may front a street or be rear loaded, which gives space to the townhouse courtyard or promenade concept that we're proposing. And on your screen, uh, it shows kind of a diagram of how some of those elements of the courtyard and minimums could be measured. This concept is popular in other jurisdictions as designers try to embrace walkable spaces instead of car centric designs. The development team has delivered the concept before in the Northern Virginia area and have seen its success. In this concept, courtyards replace what would otherwise be street between the front yards of the units, serving as a focal point and creating a sense of community while still providing for pedestrian circulation. This slide shows a diagram of how those townhomes could face a common open space. Each are committed to have front yards on a green and then a rear yard with, um, with a garage or drive. And the commitments are to have a minimum of a sidewalk and planting and the minimums of the two sh uh, structures that Ms. Deborah, uh, Ms., um, Ms. Grannon uh, stated earlier. We do have some flexibility in, in how those would be configured and we've included minimum dimensions that exceed what the, this typical product would um, involve in a more urban area um, by over 50%. Finally, uh, the heights are increased slightly that because we envision the multifamily subject district to be about four stories, um, some with a walkout basement or rooftop deck, and 50 feet in the townhome subdistrict, which we envision to be three to four stories, again, to provide that rooftop deck or garden, which is not commonly found in Cary. We received helpful feedback from the council at the public hearing and made several changes in response, which Ms. Granite has summarized. I'd like to just highlight uh, that in addition to making the lots wider and eliminating the drive through use um, and adding the electrical vehicle charging stations all in response to those comments, um, we've made significant um, commitments in terms of pedestrian connectivity. And Ms. Granin highlighted the mid block high visibility crosswalk to connect the site to Preston Walk, thereby maximizing the ability of residents to use the existing commercial facilities to the south and the pedestrian improvements along James Jackson and Cary Parkway. These were added not only uh, by suggestion of staff, but in response to comments we heard at the initial neighborhood meeting about concerns, uh, specifically concerned with that particular intersection. We also, in, in addition to um, including the complete um, high visibility crosswalks, adding ramps and upgrading the existing ramps that exist there today. The sum of these commitments and need for multifamily housing in this area supports this request is consistent with the policies highlighted by staff in the initiated comprehensive plan change to traditional neighborhood. And we're happy to answer any other questions at this time. Hey, thank you, Mr. Whitler, and thank you, Ms. Granin, for your presentations. At this time, I'd also like to welcome Chuck Montgomery, the Planning and Zoning Board member, to our meeting. Uh, he arrived a little bit late, but he will be here for our questions and discussion. Welcome, Chuck. So we have a uh, we have a full full quorum tonight. So let's start off with questions, and I'm going to ask each board member to share any questions I have, either for staff or for the applicant. So let's start off with Don Hamilton. Don, do you have any questions? Uh, just just a quick one. Uh, I appreciate Ms. Graham saying the the allowable of uh, flexibility in a case like this. I I don't recall sitting on a case for a PDD major change. Are the other changes, the taller heights, the reduction in buffer in the berms, is that common in other PDD majors? Is that comparable? Yes, yeah. But it, we um we often see flexibility in changes like that. Um, I'm trying to think of a, a recent example um, of something that Carpenter Village was one um, that was approved not long ago. You may remember the Farrell Farms case up off of um, Morrisville Carpenter Road where they actually had a PDD, they got the zoning approved, and then they had to come back for a minor amendment because they forgot to ask for the increase in building height. So they you know, came back in the next year to get the additional height that they needed. Um, this is probably a little bit taller than some of the ones that we've seen, but um, you just uh, recently recommended for approval the Dillinger PDD down in the crossroads area, and they had an increased they had an increased uh, building height there as well for a multifamily residential building. Um, so yes, we do see that. Um, okay, yeah, thank, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, Don? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Nicole Samuel, questions for staff or the applicant? 
Yeah, I have a question for the applicant. The promenade design, which I really like, um, and I agree that it could add, um, you know, community character to the space, but um, I'm just curious if that promenade design would only apply to that, like, upper right corner, the rest of the design would be a little bit more traditional. That's a great question. As the site is laid out, you'll notice that that right side, the eastern side is kind of at an angle. And so the diagram we shared um, with staff use that as the model to measure because it just has a kind of a, a funky triangle where the one side is a little bit shorter than the other. We actually are planning for two promenades and the one to the south is much more rectilinear, easier to measure, um, most likely going to be, you know, just about parallel. Um, so we didn't feel that we needed to include a diagram on that, but we do have commitments on it. Okay, great. Thank you. And then um, another question is how, what goes into your decision um, around where to, where to put the community space, the 10,000 square foot of community space? I noticed that there were about five different options, which you would select two to, to be used in the community space. So considering that you already know the size of the lots um you know is there anything else that goes into your decision making of which of the two you would select um i want to make sure i understand your question were you asking which types of uses we would select if the commercial were built well it, it mentioned how you would use the ten thousand square feet of or um i'm sorry the um, yeah the ten thousand square feet of community space yeah we were Yes, we envision that in the multifamily district because um, at the early stages of the design, we were thinking of ways to have um, that kind of double as a amenity of sorts. So kind of a we work before we work <laughs> had it had it, uh, its own challenges, but kind of a co working space that became very popular during COVID. So we wanted to provide that flexibility in case there could be kind of a detached pavilion. Um, but because of all of the challenges of commercial in general, and then you couple that with the significant amount of commercial in the area, we really felt the need to make this successful to to leave it the breathing room and flexibility to see what could be successful there instead of, you know, kind of building a shell that wouldn't be occupied. Jamie, I'm sorry if this is in violation of protocol, but I think Nicole was actually asking about the the asterisks we have on the gathering space. Right. So I think that when she was, she was talking about the community gathering space rather than the and it, they both happen to be 10,000 square feet, so I think they can yeah. be confused. <laughs> but uh, so I think, Nicole, if I could, so I'm, I'm Duncan Jones, I'm with Ackridge, and the idea is to make sure that we can deliver on what we say we're going to do. Uh, and so these are minimums on the, the open space, but the, the two asterisks on the right are each promenades on the townhome side that will be gathering spaces, and the two asterisks on the left are multifamily courtyards. So those all four of those will be community gathering spaces. The idea in the zoning text is just if if we have a development plan issue with staff, we can we can have some flexibility with how we address it. But the baseline intent is that all four of those are activated gathering spaces. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Sorry, Nicole. I misunderstood. That's okay. I I I, I it was a very long question. So <laughs> Um, but that was it. Thank you. Okay, anything else, Nicole? Nope. Here, thank you. Mary Jo Hill, questions for the applicant or the staff? I, I want to go back, and I'm not sure whether it's the applicant or staff that can address, but I, there was a reference to the, um, the entry being, the entry to, I think it was to the front of the dwellings being facing out into the commercial space or into the berm on one side. Could you repeat what that arrangement was? Uh, Jessica, that's slide 15, please. Um, yes. Town of Kerry staff, Jessica, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, there is, um, we have the opportunity because we're looking at the development plan concurrently with the rezoning um, that there's approximately 15 units that could potentially 
face a uh, perimeter buffer as opposed to facing a promenade. So through the PDD process, the applicant has the opportunity to ask for that modification as well. And this is an example of you know what was shown in the in the development plan that's in review. And so was there also um, a commitment to putting the a garage or an entry space facing out to the roadway areas or the alleys? So it would it would be um, alley loaded. So the garage entrance um, to the units is facing the alley and then the front doors are facing the perimeter buffer. There's still a sidewalk that you know circles the area. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get, you know, from the alley to the front of the unit on foot via sidewalk. Um, residents would pull into the driveway. And access the units from the rear. Mm -hmm. But the front of the unit would face the perimeter buffer. OK, so then the idea is that regardless of which way you're facing, you would have an open space in front of the unit that you would see as opposed to a driveway. Uh, no, you would not have open space on the driveway side because that's facing the alley. Well, that's right. I understand that. I'm thinking that the front door would be facing out instead of to the inside promenade because they don't have access to the promenade area, correct? So that's why they're going to be facing the berm. Um, I think I think I think I caught that. Yeah, the front door would the front door would face a perimeter buffer. Gotcha. So it would it would have landscape material in it. It would not have the amenity features in it. It, it would be vegetated and have plant material, but it wouldn't be a place to recreate. It wouldn't be community gathering space. It would be a it would be a perimeter buffer. I understand. OK, thank you for that explanation. That's You're all welcome. I have. OK, if that's it, Mary Jo, thank you. I move on to uh, Chuck Montgomery. Chuck, any questions for staff or the applicant? No, no, I, I don't have any questions. OK, thanks, Chuck. Steve Crutchfield, questions? Uh, my questions have already been covered. Thanks. Thank you. Jessica Pearson, questions for staff or applicant? Um, I, I think this is a question for uh, staff. Um, Ms. Grannon, the maximum number of units proposed is 560. Does that mean that the the development plan could actually have potentially less units, but not more than 560? That is correct. Okay. Um, so that works out to about 20 units per acre. 21.5 based on the current calculations. And how does that stack up to other um, like uh, residential zoning designations? When you look at our standard in the LDO for residential multifamily, it's very low. It's one of the lowest ones in the area. It's only 12 dwelling units per acre. Um, when you look at something like the recently approved Dillinger PDD, um, that was closer to 19 dwelling units per acre. Um, okay. So uh, we've we've got a, a couple of them. We've got a handful of them that are even higher. Um, Carpenter um, Fire Station Road recently had one that was a little over 20 units per acre. So that's the opportunity with a PDD. That's that's where you get the mix of uses. You get the innovative design and um, the applicant is held to a higher standard in other areas in exchange for the densities. You know, that that's that's the question for the board to say, is this amount of innovation? Is that balance out with the increased density and some of the other flexible standards that they're looking for? So the PDD process is one of the few flexible zoning districts that we've got. We've got MXD for the preliminary development plan and PDD. But a straight rezoning or a conditional use rezoning couldn't have that flexibility. They have to be stricter. So that's why we don't see a ton of those. Mostly what we've seen recently has been a lot of conditional use zonings. OK, that's really helpful. And then the. Um... The street connections, um, it's the applicant that's proposing to connect um, with 
their development to the existing um, tower view. street network. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of what we would expect too. Is entrances, access points into the site should line up with existing um, driveways on the opposite side of the street, and so you know we'll be looking for that at the development plan. And then okay. with the connection to Tower View, they have proposed a traffic calming measure. We don't know exactly what that's going to be yet, but they, they will put something there to help okay. slow people down, you know, as you travel from one land use to another. Okay, thank you for answering my questions. That's it for me. Okay, thank you, Jessica. John Sorrell, questions for the staff or applicant. I have one question for staff regarding the shift to the promenade style units and the alley served uh, units. Um, the alley, the change to fronting these lots off of the promenade and serving them vehicularly through the alleys seems to be a fairly technical change. Um, and from a procedural standpoint, as this moves forward into development plan review, Will staff have the flexibility to make sure that the alley widths um, are sufficient for, say, fire apparatus access um, if a standard alley width would not meet that requirement? What I'm, what I'm asking is, with the alley requirement, are we tying staff's hand um, with regard to those technical requirements later? That is an excellent question. And while I, I could take a stab at it, I'd like to ask that either uh, Rob Wilson or Priya Thamkanda from our transportation division give you a little bit more reassurance on that topic since they've both worked extensively with, you know, this new concept of alley loaded units. So, um, Rob, oh, thank and you, Rob. Okay. this is Rob. Um, Priya Tham, I'll uh, take a stab at answering this and you can fill in if I miss anything. Uh, so, John, we've uh, had a multi-departmental group of our development review team working on uh, townhome streets for a couple of years now. We actually re-engaged the group. Um, you may recall about a year ago, we adopted a uh, new one-way and two-way alley cross sections that are public alleys, and those were fully vetted by all departments. We actually took one of our out-of-commission fire trucks out in the field, drove it around a development that had been built with the cross section we were looking to use, no problems at all. We were out there on trash day when all the trash cans were out. So uh, we feel very good about the two-way alley cross section that was developed and adopted and added to our standard specs in May of 2020. When this development surfaced, uh, we revisited that cross section, recognizing that it was really intended to be used with a townhome street on the other side of the unit. And uh, we made some adjustments uh, in coordination with the engineer for this project, as well as another engineer that we've uh, done uh, some stakeholder work with in the past. And uh, July 1st of this year, just a few weeks ago, we adopted a new standard uh, detail for a courtyard style townhomes, the two-way alley cross section. And so it's a little more robust than what we had before. Uh, and it's intended to be used in situations like this. So we feel that we're off to a good start and we will look to do our best within the other existing standards to work with the uh, applicant as we think about the provision of services, the number of units, um, and so forth. Uh, Priya, thank you. Thank you. Sure. I don't have anything else to add, Rob. You got it. Okay, thanks. thanks. John, any other questions? That's it for me, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jessica McClure, questions? No, they've all been answered. Thank you. Okay, okay great. Well, I, I have a few questions um, in a no particular order. I guess uh, I saw in the report that the applicant is proposing, I think it was 0.9 parking units per bedroom. And the new, I guess this is a question maybe for, for Ms. Grannon, and the new standard for multifamily that the town has developed was 1.3 uh, uh, parking lot, park, parking spaces per apartment. Do I remember that correctly? No, we've, been, we've been going with a per bedroom rate 
and we haven't good. actually yeah we haven't actually adopted that standard um yeah. it's just the reporting on the results of the um study um that miss puckett worked on and um you know looking at how recognizing that in general carry standards were stricter than many other municipalities um which we knew <laughs> staff knew that and then and then the traffic um analysis through the parking analysis rather you know did did state that they recommended um something closer to a, a and i think erin puckett's on the line she can uh she can correct me but i was thinking it was kind of a one-to-one -one, one space per bedroom does that sound right erin that's correct. So the rate the consultant ultimately recommended was slightly higher than that to account for visitor parking and those kind of things. But essentially they found that a right size requirement would be be about one space per bedroom. Okay, so we, we haven't fully, we, I guess we haven't adopted that as of yet. Um, That's correct. So yeah, we can't necessarily see how does that really work out. And I guess so the question on the staff is, so now we have, now that we have over the years that I've been on the board, we've seen a number of requests to reduce what had been the old standard. And now we have a recommendation using the consultants and staff to go. And now we have our first application. Somebody wants to ask for, for an amendment to go even lower than that. Um, what's staff feeling on the 0.9 per bedroom, or I think it was maybe 0.95. So if, if I'm misstating that, please correct me. 0.97, yeah. 0.97, thank you. Okay, so it's 0.97, it, 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 which actually makes a difference. I mean, it's, uh, um, we did want to point out that that's only for the multifamily, mm -hmm. uh, not for the townhomes. And if there were any um, non-residential use, it wouldn't apply there, because we have we have discovered, you know, that when you've got townhouse units, reductions to parking standards um, are not supported. Staff doesn't support them. We've we've seen firsthand how that works. When you deal with multifamily parking reductions, uh, it's self-regulating to some extent because you've got a property management company there who's going to get the complaints if there's not enough parking. You know, you're building in some expectation that you're not always going to be at 100% occupancy. Um, you're building in some expectation expectations that you might have some units where somebody doesn't drive um, and where people are not coming and going at the same time. So, um, yeah, it's it's slightly lower maybe than what we would go with with the ordinance. We haven't talked about adopting any changes to the ordinance yet. Um, that's still something that's being kicked around, um, you know, with whether or not the council would like us to pursue that. But it's very close, you know, the 0 0.97 per bedroom is very close to to what the consultants said seemed to be an industry standard. Okay, I just, I just do know that in some cases, parking becomes an issue in multifamily, particularly as it um, pertains uh, occasionally with uh, ADA requirements and there's only so many ADA spaces required mm -hmm. and that uh, if your number of handicapped placards exceed that, then it becomes an issue. But I also look at the site around it, and I realize that, you know, just just a concern. This is really, I guess, a concern for the applicant and the property management company. If you get a, you know, if parking becomes an issue, you get a parking lot immediately to the north of the property, and then you've got all that retail parking to the south. And um, worst case is seeing all that overflow and potentially be a problem, but. The 0.97 is close to what the recommendation was, and I guess I, I, it, it struck me that looking for 430 units of multifamily, which is a fairly robust project, um, and then looking to reduce the parking. To, first time I've ever seen anything reduced lower than one unit per, you know, one, one car per bedroom. Um, it seems to me, you know, like it strikes me as maybe there's more multifamily on this site than the, it could be supportive if we're doing it at the expense of the parking. Um, that's just, uh, it's just an observation I have. Um, another question I have is on the building height of 65 feet, and I'm just trying to get a reference point. Is there something in, nearby? I mean, I'm curious what the, uh, the former, the office building to the north, which used to be a fitness center, is there any idea what the approximate building height of that is? That building. I do not know how tall that is. I'm sorry. 
I, we can... okay. I'm just trying to put a reference in terms of a 65 foot, and I guess uh, that would be putting a, a five story building. Five stories, yeah. Typically, okay. um, with a residential building, you're going to have somewhere in the 10 to 11, you know, feet per floor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're looking at a five story building. Okay, thank you. And, and I can provide a little bit of a frame of reference there, if I may. Um, Mr. McFarland. So uh, this is Jamie Schwather, the, the applicants rep. Um, so we did a test of what that height would look like um, along Cary Parkway. And interestingly enough, because of the way that the topo falls over there towards the area between the site and Cary Parkway is actually in Morrisville's jurisdiction. So we're not proposing to change anything with those trees. And the the, the four to five story height would be approximately just less than those trees that are standing there at that site. So if you can envision what that intersection looks like, we did a couple of mock-ups um, and it's and it's not taller than those trees. Um, okay. And then to answer your question, I just wanted to clarify in the parking reduction, most of the cases that you've seen come before you were at that ratio of per unit. So you had the 1.4, 1 1.6 and that sort of thing. And this is per bedroom. So I just wanted to make sure that you know, it, it's not a 0.97 per unit. It's just per bedroom. Per bedroom. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Another question for staff um, is, you know, we have 26 acres that are currently um, zoned for industrial. Um, what do, would this do to the overall inventory of uh, industrial zone land in the town of Cary if we were to lose this? Or not lose this, but I mean, if we were to adopt the PDD and that's that's why we have a planning and zoning board to, you know, evaluate that and weigh it and take a look at, you know, take a look at the balance opportunities. Yeah, it is a loss of industrial zone land, and staff brought that up when this first came in. Um, you know, where where do you go for some of the warehouse uses or the you know, the doggy daycare and some of the other things that are, you know, definitely important to a community. And then you look across the street at a shopping center with restaurants that have been struggling because they could use more rooftops. Um, you know, you, you look at the balance, you look at how more multifamily housing is in such demand and townhome housing, you know, as people are looking for homes in carry so you ask yourself is this a good long-term solution um we know that there is definitely a housing um, need in carry for all types of housing so yeah it does it does deplete that supply it makes it harder to come by um, but housing is also hard to come by as well so that that's all part of the beauty of the imagine carry community plan is that you you know have that chance to look at you know, well, is there an industrial use here that would make it worthwhile for the the property owners to break the lease on those radio towers? Probably not. Um, whereas a residential multifamily development project could, you know, make incentivize this to redevelop. And it's been like this as long as I can remember. I've been in Cary a long time. And we always thought the radio towers were, you know, going to be there forever. <laughs> well, I, and, and I agree. I feel as long as I've been here in Cary for going on 34 years, I've always been there. And and I, I just asked that question really from an inventory perspective yeah, because, yeah. you know, I've been in that industry office business park multiple times. I've seen tenants churn through there. Obviously, the fitness center has gone through transitions. Um, and I'm not saying it's inappropriate, it's, it's more just that bigger, you know, I just want to make sure, you know, there's, there's other opportunity sites within Cary for, uh, for industrial use. I know we have office, but, um, but uh, I know that we have other areas also. So, you, just out of curiosity, if you don't know that, if it, no, none of the staff know, I just want to know if anybody has the sense of what is the total acreage the town currently has, it's zoned industrial? Just so it did put 26 acres into perspective. Is it drop in the bucket or is it like where is this significant? Uh, don't have um, that at my fingertips. Rob, okay. you uh you I thought I heard you chime in. Did you have some insight on that? Well, I'm curious, are we asking about undeveloped or developed? 
or undeveloped. undeveloped. I'm, looking, I'm thinking more of opportunity sites. So undeveloped. Yeah. There's uh, other than out near the airport, I think we have very, very little uh, industrially zoned land in town and uh, very little of that is undeveloped. Yeah. Yeah. There's just but a again, handful of sites that I'm aware of, like down off with the um, uh, Cary Parkway and uh, Tryon, there's a parcel there. And then Woodwinds Industrial Park is pretty much built out. Right. Uh, there's certainly opportunities I know for redevelopment and I want to uh turn this into that discussion i just want to have a sense but yeah up by the airport i know we've done some recent uh, rezoning out there okay that uh that answers the question i had there and then the last question i have is um for staff has the uh applicant offered any uh, income targeting for the workforce housing was mentioned you know all the retail and service centers within a mile and two mile of this area and which is wonderful as an amenity for a resident, but when we talk about workforce housing and those folks who are living there, as we've seen recently in some other cases, targeting a percentage of units for those who are at 60, 80%, which in carry is still a very significant uh, income level when you, the median income being for a family of four being over $100,000. Um, I didn't know if there's any targeting or, or set asides that were discussed. Well, topics like that come up from time to time, but we do not have a current proposal um, from the applicant. Okay, thank you. And I'm happy to address any kind of questions you have on that, uh, Mr. McFarland. Is that something that uh, I can't? Obviously, I know I can't ask that, question, but you know, <laughs> what is what? What's the applicant's thought on that? Yeah, on um, it, it, it you know it's a it's a pressing um, issue I think in in towns all over the United States right now. Um, in this particular site, what's really underserved is this type of product, and um, you have a lot of single family housing, and that the cost of that existing stock is rising. And so, we think the right fit here is providing the the additional supply in this location um, and a different type of product that will uh, allow. Um, for that kind of naturally occurring additional product and supply, but not a, um, a restriction on the affordability. I heard what you said. I'm not quite sure if I understand, but I guess um, restriction on the affordability. I, you know, I, I guess the other way I look at it is that I see townhome development going on in the town that are at six hundred thousand dollars. Which means that you know you're at an income range that you've got to be at the median, if not above the median income, and kind of carry to afford. And we also know over on the western side of town, we see apartments that um, are going at fifteen hundred to over two thousand dollars a unit. Um, so, in terms of as we look at workforce housing, those folks who are working across the street, working in that uh, commercial industrial park there working at uh, any of those places that were mentioned within a mile or two miles, you know, that sort of market approach does, doesn't do anything for the housing need for those folks. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, so uh, without some conditions and, 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 you know, and considerations. So I don't have any other questions uh, for that. Are there one more time around? Does any other members of the Planning and Zoning Board have any questions left on the table? Hearing none, uh, for this item, as was mentioned in the beginning, we need to make two separate motions and vote on each item individually. The first motion will be for the Comprehensive Plan Amendment, which Act 19, which, and that's on your screen in front of you. Would, any, would someone make a motion for Act 19? And the motions are there, as you can see. This is Mary Jo. I will make that motion. I Please. move. That the board forward the Act 19 amendment to the Cary Community Plan to Town Council with a recommendation for approval to amend the comprehensive plan as proposed. So we're second. I'll um, second that. This is Jessica Pearson. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, Mary Jo, you want to start some of the discussion? Um, I think just because of the location and some of the discussion that we just had in terms of the need for local for housing um, in Cary, and I think that's only going to continue to to increase. Um, this is a big a big open space, I guess, with the 
reduction of those towers, which I got to admit, I'm still curious about, but um, just the need for the housing seems to supersede the need for this industrial warehouse area. There are already some looks like industrial strip sort of areas along Cary Parkway before this plot. And um, I know that the need is never enough for somebody that wants to put something there, but this has been wide open for a long time, although obviously we couldn't build on it before now, but um, I think that this is a reasonable approach to the use of that land. Um, and is very consistent with the plan in several of the areas that were mentioned. So that, that's the basis for my approval. Thanks, Mary Jo. Jessica, your thoughts? Um, I, I think the only thing I would add is that, um, you know, when we were asked to consider amending the comprehensive plan because a new opportunity has come along that the comprehensive plan Previous to this opportunity with the radio towers, it should be industrial because that's appropriate. That's an appropriate use for um, radio towers. But I, I agree with Mary Jo, given the location and the fact that the radio towers are now moving. This is a um, this is a, a I think a, a, a logical step. And so I do think that this use is appropriate, and I think this comprehensive plan amendment is appropriate as well. And um, I appreciate everything that the applicant has offered in regards to the innovative design and the quality materials in order to get the higher density. So th those are just my thoughts. Thanks, Jessica. Okay, I'll go around for the, uh, for the other board members. Don, any, uh, any discussion on this item? No, no, sir. Okay, thank you. Nicole Samuel. No, not for me. Okay, Chuck Montgomery. Yeah, I'm, I agree with what's been said before. It was so obvious before that it should be industrial with those towers there. And with the towers gone, uh, you have to step back, take a new look at it. And I think the need for uh, residential housing is the appropriate use. Thank you. Steve Crutchfield, any thoughts for the discussion? Uh, nothing else to add right now. Okay, thank you. John Sorrell. No discussion. Hey, Jessica McClure. Uh, nothing to add. And, you know, I concur what's been said, I think, with the removal of the towers and this now really becomes an opportunity site. Um, that wasn't that wasn't identified when the, uh, when the carry community plan management community carry community plan was developed a few years ago. And when you sit back and you say, what makes the most sense? And you look at, you know, the development has been there by Preston in, in, in that area and the other three corners, as was mentioned, it seems to make the most sense. So, um, I, I also concur. Okay, I'll call on each of you to please state your vote. Uh, if there's no other discussion and hearing none, Don Hamilton. Aye. Nicole Samuel. Aye. Mary Jo Hill. Aye. Chuck Montgomery. Aye. Steve Crutchfield. Aye. Jessica Pearson. Aye. John Sorrell. Aye. Jessica McClure. Aye. And I vote aye as well. So that motion passes unanimously. Would somebody like to make a motion on 21 REZ01, the Tower View Court PDD rezoning? The motions are before you. I'll make a motion, Chuck. Uh, motion to find, I'm sorry, 21 REZ Tower to PDD. I, I move the board find case number 21 REZ01 to be consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans for the reasons set forth in the staff report, presentation, and discussion by the Planning and Zoning Board. Thank you. Is there a second on the motion? I can second the motion. Okay. Thank you, Jessica McClure, for the second. All right. Any discussion? I'll start off with Steve. Um, We've, we've already pretty much covered it, but I, I just feel that this is a, a very good long term solution. As we've said, um, the reduction in, in, in the industrial 
I, I don't know that that's a big concern right now, considering where the housing market is. Um, I think that the new use is is well thought out, and as, as others have said, you've got retail that I guess will be across the street that has struggled for a number of years that this might actually help. And then lastly, I think it's very consistent with the with the plan uh, because of the, the housing it will address. And I think this is a lot better fit than trying to shove more retail type establishments back here. Okay, thanks, Steve. Jessica Pearson, your thoughts? Uh, just, I would just want to echo what I said before that I just appreciate the um, the applicants innovative design and quality materials and just the very thorough the fact that they reacted to comments from town council. Um, I, I just feel like it's a very strong application. I also appreciate the street connections and just all of the things that were presented tonight um, that I think this is going to make a, a really great uh, development. Great. Thank you. Don Hamilton, any any points for discussion on this motion? No, sir. Okay, Nicole Samuel. No. Mary Jo Hill. No further discussion. Okay, Chuck Montgomery. Um, just one point. I thought John's question about the width of the alleys was a very pertinent question, and um, and the idea of being able to get emergency vehicles, fire trucks, et cetera, in there. Is important, and I was glad to hear uh, that it does uh, conform to what the town expects in that regard. So I'm in favor of the motion. Thank you, John Sorrell. Overall, I support the plan, and I think it's consistent. Um, it, it is interesting to see the concept with the promenade and the alley served lots. Uh, to me. It, it, from a design perspective, it feels like a pendulum swing back to the garage fronted lots um, that a lot of the alleys came out to get the garages off the fronts of the building. Um, to me, this seems like a swing back to that, but with a substandard alley street in lieu of a, of a normal street. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it doesn't push me far enough to change my support from the plan, uh, but I just, I think it's interesting to see us moving back towards garage fronted units with a uh, open space in the back, regardless of which side of the building you call the front or the back. Um, so all that said, um, it generally in support. Thanks, John. Jessica McClure? No, sir. Okay. You know, I, I want to echo, I think what Jessica Pearson said is I appreciate the applicants uh, responsiveness to the feedback that's gotten from the community and from the council, including the. Uh, increasing back the width of the town homes from uh, to 20 from the original pur uh, proposed 16. Uh, some of the materials, the roof line, some of the design characteristics, uh, uh, particularly think about the visual of it as you. Going over Cary Parkway over the railroad tracks here at a higher area. I also certainly appreciate the, uh, the pedestrian uh, crossing upgrades that have been proposed for James Jackson North, Northwest Cary Parkway because that's really important because the only sidewalk to be able to get to Park West here is actually in the Morrisville side. So it's it's a challenge, and I think most of us have all driven that part of Cary Parkway, which at times can turn into a uh, a speedway. Um, so overall, I also support it. So with that, I will call on each of you to please state your vote. Uh, Don Hamilton. Aye. Nicole Samuel. Aye. Mary Jo Hill. Aye. Thank you. Chuck Montgomery. Aye. Steve Crutchfield. Aye. Jessica Pearson. Aye. John Sorrell. Aye. Jessica McClure. Aye. And I vote in the affirmative as well. It passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you well, very much. Move on, move on to uh, thank you for the applicant uh, for being with us. Uh, we'll move on to our next case. The second item before us this evening is rezoning case 21 REZ04, the Wellington Park PDD amendment for parcel C2. 
Planner Aaron Puckett will share the staff's presentation and following Ms. Puckett's remarks, all board members uh, will have an opportunity to ask questions of staff. And I guess I should ask, is there the applicant uh, also present? Are they going to be making a present? I don't see it in the, I didn't see it in my notes. They are, yes. They are, okay. So I didn't see that in, in my notes. I'm, that's, so I'm glad I caught that. So after Ms. Puckett, we will hear from the applicant and then we will have opportunity to ask questions of um, both the staff and the applicant. Ms. Puckett, please, you may proceed. Thank you. And good evening, board. This is a request to rezone approximately one acre located at 301 Wellingboro Drive. The site is located at the northwest corner of Thurston Drive and Wellingboro Drive. Residential portions of Wellington Park surround the site to the north and east, and the Wellington Park Shopping Center is just south of the site. The Marla Durrell Park and Kids Together Playground are located about 500 feet to the west. According to Carey's GIS, there are no stream buffers present on the site. Field determination of such features is required at time of development plan review. We also note that drainage for this site flows to the southwest, joining up with a larger stream that flows south towards Lockmere. Both Thurston and Wellingboro Drive are collector avenues. Sidewalk is already existing along both of this property's frontages. The parcel is currently zoned Plan Development District Major, or PDD Major, and is in the Wellington Park PDD. It's currently zoned for a daycare use only, and the applicant proposes to amend the PDD. The proposed amendment specifically modifies parcel C2 of the Wellington Park PDD. The original PDD zoned this parcel for a nursery school use, or what would be defined as a daycare under the current LDO meaning that a daycare use could be developed today without the need for a rezoning. The proposed amendment would change the use to office uses, including business or professional office and wellness center. A question was raised by both citizens and council members as to what precisely would be allowed under the wellness center use. So I did want to explain that use further. The LDO defines wellness center as a business providing customized health services, such as personal training, nutritional counseling, or other specialty medical or health related uses. This use is more closely related to a medical office type use than a gym, even though limited fitness equipment may be provided. A gym use or a business offering specialized or boutique fitness classes, such as a yoga or dance studio, would not be permitted under this zoning, as those uses fall within the commercial recreational facility use. Other conditions include limiting the maximum building size to 10,000 square feet, and specifically limiting any wellness center use to 5,000 square feet. Limiting the building height to a maximum of two above grade stories. Limiting on site light poles to a maximum height of 25 feet, which is 12 feet below the maximum height allowed by the LDO. And providing a 30 foot wide type A streetscape along the property frontage on both Thurston Drive and Wellingboro Drive. The original PDD proposed a 25 foot streetscape, but the 30 foot width matches the current LDO requirement. The type A planting standard is above the planting rate that would otherwise be required for a non-residential use. The applicant has also provided a number of architectural conditions, including precluding the use of stucco or EFIS in the building facade, limiting the roof type and materials to prohibit clay tile and mansard or gambrel roof forms, and limiting certain materials such that they would not be visible from the street, as well as prohibiting fabric awnings. The applicant also proposes one modification, which would be the ability to locate the building at the rear of the site with parking in between the building and the road. The LDO typically requires buildings at intersections of thoroughfares or collectors to be located at the intersection with parking located behind. However, given the increased streetscape plannings, reduced light pole heights, and the location adjacent to a residential neighborhood, the modification could be justified. Although this request appears relatively straightforward, we note that based on the highly attended neighborhood meeting and public hearing, which you'll hear about in a while, there are a number of concerns with this rezoning from nearby residents. With this in mind, we thought it was important to clearly show the differences between the existing and proposed development standards as a point of clarification. 
The existing PDD standards only specified the use of the property and the 25 foot streetscape for this parcel, meaning dimensional standards and other requirements would default to the LDO under the current entitlement, as we'll be, we'll be showing on this slide. As noted previously, the most substantial changes to the use, which can be built on the property. So the site is currently permitted to develop as a daycare only, and the rezoning would change the use to those uses listed in our LDO's office category. In regards to these uses, I did want to note that one of the concerns we heard is about the potential traffic this office use could create. Staff did research the trip generation for both medical office, which is the highest trip generator of the proposed uses, and daycare, and found that a 10,000 square foot daycare had more than triple the number of peak hour trips of a 10,000 square foot medical office use in both AM and PM peak hours. The existing zoning does not specifically limit size or height, and we do note that a two-story daycare is somewhat uncommon, but, but could be allowed today. The original PDD allowed a 25-foot non-residential streetscape along both frontages, and as a reminder, that means three upper story and five understory trees per 100 linear feet. Whereas the new proposal offers a 30 foot type A streetscape, which is four upper story and 14 understory trees per, line, per 100 linear feet. Light pole height is currently allowed at the LDO standard, which would be a max of 37 feet. And regarding the one modification, a daycare use would be required to be located at the corner of the property with parking in the rear, unless it was at least 10 feet below the grade of the roadway. An analysis of the request against the policies of the Imagine Carry Community Plan finds the policies in the work and shape chapters apply. The rezoning for an office use could support several work chapter policies by helping provide a new location for an existing carry business, while also providing a location for a small office site in an area at the edge of an existing residential development and across the street from an existing shopping center. Regarding the shape chapter, this site would be infill development, being the last remaining undeveloped Wellington Park subdistrict, aside from required open space. With the limitation on the number of stories and light pole height and the proposed type A streetscape, this use could provide a reasonable transition from adjacent residential uses and the shopping center to the south. The increased streetscape and limitations on building materials could also help ensure a level of aesthetic quality. The site is located in a traditional neighborhood on the Future Growth Framework map. Neighborhood commercial or small format commercial uses can be appropriate incidental uses in these areas. This location on the edge of the traditional neighborhood and adjacent to a commercial center could support a small non-residential use. A virtual neighborhood meeting was held in April and 72 nearby property owners attended. They had questions and concerns regarding traffic and site access, drainage and environmental impacts, the width of the streetscapes, potential light impacts, the building height and design, concerns with potential under parking that might cause spillover on neighborhood roads, and a desire to keep the property zoned for a daycare use rather than office. After the neighborhood meeting, the applicant revised conditions in response to some of the citizen feedback. They added the condition to limit light pole height to 25 feet and increase the streetscape width from a 25 foot type A, which they had initially proposed to a 30 foot type A. Additional emails from seven citizens have been received by planning staff, most with similar concerns regarding traffic impacts, site drainage, business hours of operation, potential site access conflicts, concerns with the use and size, and with clarifying questions about the request and the rezoning process. A virtual public hearing was held at the June 10th council meeting. 10 written comments were provided by email or 311 and four call-in speakers spoke at the meeting. Concerns included traffic, drainage, lighting, and the aesthetics and height of the building. Some citizens voiced a preference for open space, a park, or residential uses, while others prefer to see a daycare use at this location as is permitted under the existing zoning. There were concerns expressed with a potential radio or television broadcasting use, which was initially included in this request. And there was also a petition submitted with signatures from 375 individuals in opposition to the request. The applicant has made a number of changes to conditions since the public hearing. These include removing the broadcasting studio use from consideration, limiting any wellness center to a maximum of 5,000 square feet, prohibiting stucco and EFIS materials in the building facades, 
prohibiting mansard and gambrel roof forms, as well as clay roofing tiles, ensuring any mirror glass, glazed brick, or exposed CMU block used in the site is not visible from the street, and prohibiting fabric awnings. Staff's preliminary finding is for consistency with the Imagine Carry Community Plan. We found that the request supports several work policies as it helps support an existing carry business while also providing an opportunity for additional small businesses. The small infill site does appear to provide an appropriate transition between the larger shopping center to the south and the residential neighborhood to the north and east. And the increased streetscape and limitations on building materials and roof forms help ensure some aspects of the aesthetics of the development. The size and use also appear to be consistent with the traditional neighborhood designation, which, which supports small commercial uses when located on the edge of these areas. So in evaluating the request, the board may wish to consider a number of questions, such as whether the requested PDD amendment for office uses is appropriate in this location, and whether it would provide appropriate transitions between adjacent uses. This concludes my presentation. Following the applicant's comments, uh, I am available to answer any questions. Danny Howell, the applicant's representative, is on the line to speak to the applicant's request. And Mr. Howell, you may begin. Mr. Howell, I think you're muted. Thank you. It would not allow me to unmute. So thank you for whoever just unmuted me. That's very appreciated. Uh, my name is Danny Howell with Real Engineering. Uh, good evening, PZB members and staff. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak on behalf of our request for minor PDD amendment uh, to the Wellington Park PDD, specifically parcel C2 uh, for uh, 21 REZ04 located at 301 Wellington Drive. Thanks, Aaron, for the great overview of the project. Our request for PDD amendment stems from the current property sole allowable proposed use as a nursery or daycare facility. Our client applicant wish to bring their family dental practice to this community. The current plan is for their practice to occupy four to 5,000 square feet of the maximum 10,000 square foot two story commercial building and lease remaining space to one of the requested proposed uses in our conditions that Aaron went over earlier. We have had plenty of coordination with our potential neighbors. Uh, since our very informative neighborhood meeting in April, in early April, where we discussed a variety of topics, including but not limited to building height, architecture, vehicular and pedestrian traffic, access points, uh, perimeter streetscape buffers, site lighting, impervious and stormwater, tenants and parking. For these from these conversations, we elected to increase our entire streetscape buffer from the current PDD required width of 25 feet to LDO required 30 foot width as well as increasing the planning intensity to a type A opacity standard. There's also an additional five foot of parking offset and a 10 foot building setback from the 30 foot type A streetscape buffer to further provide buffer and screening from our roadway frontages. We also chose to reduce the allowable site lighting pole height to 25 foot max from the LDO allowable 37 foot height. We also removed certain building materials mentioned in staff report and our conditions that would not complement the adjacent residential development. In doing this, we hope that we address topics brought up during our previous neighborhood meeting and continue coordination efforts with the neighbors, and we look forward to moving our request forward. We would like to reiterate that by right, under the current LDO, a 10,000 square foot daycare facility could be permitted and constructed on the existing 1.08 acre site with the building adjacent to a 25 foot non-residential streetscape buffer with 37 foot tall site lighting. The traffic generated by a daycare facility is at the worst possible peak times for AM and PM traffic. Our estimated office traffic would be four to five times less than the AM peak and three to four times less than the PM peak trips generated by a daycare facility of this size. Our estimated daily traffic would be 50 to 75% of the estimated daily traffic for a daycare facility and is distributed throughout the day. Our zoning amendment request is consistent with the Imagine Carry Community Plan in that uh, promotes the development of infield projects and bringing its foundations to fruition by promoting living, working, shopping, engaging, shaping, moving, and serving the community's needs within the community. 
We would like to thank you for your time and consideration of our request to modify the Wellington Park PDD to allow our requested uses on parcel C2. Our client, Dr. Brandon Smith of Smith Family Dental Solutions and our architects, Rob Kramer and Paul Fox of 310 Architecture and Interiors, as well as myself are available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howell, and thank you, Ms. Bucket, for your presentations. Uh, appreciate that very much. So, what I'm going to ask each board member at this point uh, if you have any questions. And I'm going to start out the top of the lineup is Don Hamilton. Questions for the staff or applicant? Uh, uh, no questions. All mine centered on the existing versus proposed, and that was answered during the presentation. Great. Thanks, Don. Nicole Samuel, do you have questions? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Mary Jo Hill, any questions? I don't have any questions. Okay, thanks. Chuck Montgomery, questions? Uh, no questions. Steve Crutchfield, questions? I, I don't think so. Uh, based on the changes that were made uh, with the removal of the, I guess, broadcast studio, that was going to be really my main questions and concerns. So at this point, I think I'm okay. okay great. Thank you. Uh, Jessica Pearson, questions. Um, I, I think I have three quick questions. Uh, when was the original PDD approved? I believe that was the late 80s. I believe 1988 was actually the year that that PDD was approved. Okay, and the site is currently undeveloped? That's correct. So with that 88 approval, it was entitled for a daycare use, but that site has remained vacant since that time. And um, my last question is that as part of the development of the site, whether it was a daycare or whether it was a dental practice, there would be sidewalks that would go. Uh, so the neighborhood would be able to use sidewalks to go around this new development to the adjacent park. Is that correct? That is correct. So there actually are sidewalks along both of the frontages on this site today. So it's got sidewalk on the Wellingboro Drive frontage and the Thurston Drive frontage. Um, of course, the only difference is there could be an access point that breaks up the sidewalk that's there today. Okay. And um, Dan, we we reserve our comments for the next part of the discussion, right? Correct. Yes, okay. we have plenty of opportunity for comments and just at the discussion section. Okay, those are my only questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. John Sorrell, do you have any questions? Uh, very thorough, no questions. Okay, Jessica McClure, question? Um, yes, just wanted a question on the clarification for the um, 320 person um, petition against this. Was this before or after traffic was discussed with them? I don't know if the client. I can speak to that first, and then if the client wants to to add on. So timing wise, that um, came in between the time of the neighborhood meeting and the public hearing, and then it was shared with council by a citizen during the public hearing. Um, okay. So that's that would have been after they um, kind of got some initial feedback at the neighborhood meeting, but we had not yet pulled those specific traffic numbers to share with the public. That's something we do on our front end internally to determine if they need a traffic study or not at time of rezoning. Um, but I believe those specific numbers were not shared at the neighborhood meeting. Okay. And Aaron's absolutely right. As always. <laughs> okay. That, Anything I'm else, good. Jessica? You're good. Okay. I have a few questions. I, I appreciate that clarification. So if I understand that the the petition came between the neighborhood meeting and the first public hearing before town council. Okay, so the, the, we would have then had the hearing before town council and then some of the uh, amendments that we've seen, some of the conditions since then. Um, I don't have the zoning map in front of me, but the land that surrounds this site, the C2 site, is that is that HOA land, is that Wellington HOA property? That's correct. So, and this is a, a great map. Um, so if you see the, the purple PDD zone site that kind of surrounds this property to the north and to the west, that is actually a zoned open space parcel of the Weldon Park PDD. Um, so it, we would expect that it would continue to be 
zoned as open space. It could not be developed today without a rezoning. And we know typically council is not supportive of a rezoning of um, established open space. Okay. And I, I'm just out of curiosity. And that, so that's, that's under the, um, I guess the ownership and the, uh, of, of the Wellington HOA or some entity such as that then. Actually, I should clarify. So, because of a strange situation in this case, there are several designated open space parcels in Wellington Park. This is actually one of them that have somehow somehow come to be under private ownership. Um, it does not change the zoning. So, the gentleman who owns this site today cannot develop it. it it's still just open space. But um, for whatever reason, the developer did not turn over all the open space parcels to the HOA as they um, arguably should have done at <laughs> some time in the past. Uh, I'm just curious. Well, you know, we we've learned a lot since 1988 uh, when this when this came about, uh, <laughs> which was the year I moved to Cary. Um, question: if, You know, the applicant saying that five thousand, so ten thousand square foot building total. 5,000 for wellness would the, does the, in, because the applicant has been identified and he has written, he's communicated with the, at least, I believe with all the board members about um, asking about uh, regarding this case. So we know, I'm assuming that it's a dental practice that's moving in. Does that qualify as the wellness? And I guess it, it part of the, the, my clarification is, is, you know, is that going to be part of the office or the wellness center? So the dental office is actually classified under that office portion. So business or okay. professional office in our ordinance actually does encapsulate medical office as well. Um, so that adding the wellness center use um, is, I believe, because the applicant in this case believes they may not use the entire 10,000 square feet for the dental practice. Um, so that would leave some square footage that could be any other type of office use or anything that falls into that sort of um, limited wellness center use. So things like, like nutritional counseling, acupuncturists that could pot potentially be complementary to some office uses. Okay, so yeah, I was thinking about that. I mean, would like physical therapy fall, fall within that, within a wellness I, center? I believe so. So the way yeah. we read right. that definition, physical therapy could be a wellness center use. Okay, right. I just had a, one more question is this originally was referred to as a nursery and has been classified really within preschool. What's the definition of preschool? Is it by age? I mean, is it like an age restriction? Like a preschool is defined as something up to five years old or six years old or. So, in this case, it actually the nursery school use that was entitled in 88, we're thinking is actually most comparable to our current definition of daycare. So it's actually not even preschool. It's a little bit different. Um, and I can pull up the definition of that if you give me just 20 seconds. I should have already had it ready to go and I thought I had it in my notes, but I did not. It, um, and I asked that because and pull it up because there's a reason, there's actually a reason I'm asking that is that then within that definition of daycare, where is it also encompass adult daycare? As a as a use, so within that daycare designation, could it also? We often have to think of daycare as being, you know, toddlers, etc. But would adult daycare fall within that also? I believe in this case, since it was designated as a nursery school use only, we would probably inter because that's the current zoning on the site says nursery school. It doesn't even say okay. daycare. That's just our closest LDO use. So I think we would interpret that as being for children. Um, okay. I can't. I. Agree with you, Aaron. That makes that makes sense. Thank you, Deborah. That that's fine. I just um, and when, then one last thing. I looked within the uh, and within the application, and uh, I know the LDO allowed a, a building height of I think it was thirty five to fifty feet. Um, is there is they're proposing a two story building? But I didn't see any height restriction. Would it just be a standard two story building, which would be probably about twenty five feet, roughly twenty five thirty feet, depending on the the design. But there's no there's no height restriction put in as a condition. I didn't see. That's correct. And when you thank you for going to that slide. What the reason we referenced it as a range is that range is based on how far there's the building ends up being set back from a residential district. 
um, where this site is located, it's very close to being in that 100 foot separation from a residential district. So actually, depending on where the building is situated on the site, it could potentially be capped at 35 or they could potentially go higher. Um, so we, you're correct. Yes, the applicant currently does not have a condition in place that would limit the height by feet. Um, and I believe their architect is on the line if you want them to speak more to that, but we do not have a condition that would strictly uh, limit that currently. Well, that, that, that's fine, but the condition is it's, it'll be a two-story building. Correct. Okay. And that's right. two above grade stories, so there could potentially be something below grade, I should clarify. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Are there any other questions from the Planning and Zoning Board? Hearing this, this is Steve. I have one other question, if that's okay. Please. Yes, absolutely, Steve. Go ahead. It's a, it's more of a clarification. So, if if this wasn't approved and someone did come in to build a daycare, what what approvals would they 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 would not have to get any approvals from the town council, any zoning? They could just come in, present a plan to to the town staff, and and potentially build something. That would, um, as long as it fit on the lot and you know met met the town's normal standards, that would be all that would be required, right? Just want to make sure. That's correct. So under the current zoning, someone could file a development plan for a daycare use tomorrow. Would not require any council action um, unless it proposed like a major parking reduction or something like that. It wouldn't need CBOA action. So yes, they could do a development plan by right. Tomorrow with a daycare use. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to make sure I understood that. Good. Thanks, Steve. One last call. Any questions from the Planning and Zoning Board? Hearing none, would somebody like to make a motion on 21 REZ04, the Wellington Park PDD Amendment Parcel C2? The motions are provided on the screen for you. I will. Um, I move that the board find case number 21 REZ04 is consistent with the comprehensive plan and all other applicable plans for the reasons set forth in the staff report presentation and discussion by the planning and zoning. Thank you, John. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Please go right ahead, Nicole. Oh, thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, let's have a discussion. John, you want to start us off on, this, on the discussion? Sure. This one seems really straightforward to me. Um, you know, when we look at transitional commercial uses that are adjacent to residential, impact is a big question. And the uses that are proposed here are very comparable or lower impact um, than that which is currently entitled. Um, and everywhere where there's a um, a way to mitigate that impact with additional buffer. Um, they're they're doing that, and so to me, this seems like a really good uh, good product moving forward. It seems very reasonable, um, and you know, ultimately, uh, there's a very very narrow use on the property today, and, and this opens it up to a more reasonable range of uses. Thank you, John Nicole. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with that. I can see um, how residents would have an opinion about what is in their neighborhood or adjacent to their neighborhood, but ultimately, you know, um, over 30 years, market demands change, and I think that we need to have flexibility to to address that. So um, I agree, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, thank you. Don Hamilton, do you have any points for discussion? No, not really. I agree with what John and Nicole said. I, uh, my mom lives right around the corner from there, so I drove over and took a look at the site. And John's right; it's going to have a very minimal impact on the on the community next door. Thank you, Don. Mary Jo Hill. I agree. With, I agree with the comments that have been made. I think it's a, an easy uh, opportunity to approve. Thank you, Chuck Montgomery. Yes, I'm, I'm very familiar with this site as well, um, and I understand the, the neighbor's concerns, but I think uh, uh, the developer has 
um, address those concerns in the best possible way. And, um, and this should fit in uh, nicely with the neighborhood. I had, they paid attention to the change in uh, materials that might be allowed uh, to better accommodate uh, the neighborhood in that regard. So um, I would be in support of it. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Steve Crutchfield. Um, I, I agree with what's been said. I um, I understand the neighborhood's concerns, and and, and I, I don't blame them. But I, I would worry that a daycare could actually be open seven days a week. I mean, you've got a hospital just not far from there that has you know it's open twenty four seven. The amount of traffic. Um, it just seems like this usage would actually help more with pedestrians and 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 cars. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it it probably would be a better fit than what could be there possibly. Okay, thanks, Steve. Jessica Pearson. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think the use is consistent. I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I, I do appreciate the neighbors, um, their petition. I appreciate their emails. You know, not, the, the site is undeveloped, and so many of them have probably lived in this neighborhood and not thought that anything would be developed. Um, there is a, a by right development, uh, the daycare use. Um, and so while I appreciate their concerns, um, I do think that the, the rezoning application is a better use. It's more consistent with um, being adjacent to a neighborhood. Um, and I also appreciate that the there's like the HOA open space parcel around it. So, um, so that access to the park is still preserved. Um, and so I, I feel like um, their concerns will be mitigated even after this, um, hopefully is approved by town council and developed. So um, that, those are my thoughts. So I, I am in support of the, of the rezoning. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And Jessica McClure. Um, I I just agree with what Steve said. He hit it on the head. I think of uh, you know potentially operating more days a week, and um, I know daycare there would probably be super convenient for anybody that lived in that neighborhood. Um, but I think just overall impacts um, the change in the buy right or the change to the buy right will be will be helpful. Thank you. You know, I'll, I'll offer my, my two cents is that, you know, the question before us, before the planning and zone, the town of Cary's planning and zoning board is do we find the motion to be consistent with a comprehensive plan? Um, and I think, you know, what I'm sensing is that there's a unanimous yes, that, that this zoning is, is consistent with the plan because what's called for in the plan is basically uh, commercial development, although as specified in the original PDD as being a nursery, it is still keeping with that. And what we're seeing is that being fleshed out a little bit further um, and the applicant being trying to be responsive in terms of the building that's going in, not necessarily the use, but the building, that in essence, you know, this is defining exactly how that's going to be developed and, and how it's going to be built out. Although it's not necessarily a nursery, uh, what we do see is going to be it's going to have a minimal impact compared to what it could be, even if it was a nursery slash daycare. And it also, you know, for folks who may be watching this or coming back and watching the videotape, I know that the boards received a lot of emails. We are aware of the petition. I was at the town council meeting last Thursday at the public speaks out uh, on this, and there was a number of people that, uh, from the neighborhood who spoke out on this. We understand that we hear that um, I speak firsthand living in a neighborhood for 33 years and I've seen land that's been developed adjacent to my neighborhood. When my kids played in the woods that are no longer there, it's all, you know, bricks and, and asphalt. Um, so I understand that change and I'm very familiar with that neighborhood. I arrived it's on my bicycle route. I have literally can honestly say I've probably ridden by that parcel at least 100 times, um, you know, where the, where the sidewalks are and aren't. Uh, hopefully the HOA will come back to the town council and I know some folks are concerned about sidewalks. They were the lack of sidewalks on the opposite side of the street and also some pedestrian crossings, but that's not for the applicant. That's for the town to address. But I think on the whole, I think that the use is, is compatible. Um, 
And I think what they did with, you know, I think it's going to be the minimal impact. You know, this parcel has sat on the market for 33 years um, unused. And so the market is speaking to the degree that, you know, nobody wants to, it's not a business venture to be had as building a, a nursery and a daycare. And for those who felt as though that, you know, it should remain as an open space, you have uh, 335 names on a petition and an HOA that uh, could have bought this parcel and kept it in perpetuity as as, as uh, green space. So, um, but that you know that, that there, so there was an opportunity there. But uh, that's the end of my discussions. And so let's uh, uh, call for each of you for a vote. There will be a verbal vote. So please state your vote, beginning with Don Hamilton. Don. Aye. Nicole Samuel. Aye. Mary Jo Hill. Aye. Chuck Montgomery? Aye. Steve Crutchfield? Aye. Jessica Pearson? Aye. John Sorrell? Aye. Jessica McClure? Aye. I vote in the affirmative as well, so this motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Now we're moving on to uh, new and old business. We have one item of new business tonight. Uh, it's the, the item before us is the, the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the wrap session that was held back in June, uh, facilitated by a gentleman, True Pettigrew with True Access. Uh, he has been working as a consultant with the town, the town staff, and I know particularly uh, True has done a lot of work with the Cary Police Department over the last several years uh, around this important issue of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Don Hamilton and I both had an opportunity to attend this wrap session. Uh, the two representatives from each of the town boards were able to attend uh, back in June, what they referred to as a wrap session, where we had a discussion about uh, diversity and uh, equity and inclusion. Maybe we'll start off with Don. Don, maybe if you have any thoughts or reflections uh, on on that session, maybe we'll start off with you, Don. Yes, I appreciate, I appreciate it, Dan. Uh, yeah, we get opened by uh, Mayor Weinbrecht uh, introducing everybody, and as Dan said, uh, True Predigrew led it. He's a local author, community bridge builder, and I didn't know this, but he's an award-winning marketing exec. Uh, they, they ask us four questions, uh, the first being to define diversity, inclusion, and equity. And what we came up with as a group, diversity is actually the state of something. It's the state of being different, uh, where inclusion is an actual act. The act of making people feel they're an active participant in whatever you're working on. And then it ended with equity is giving people what they need to succeed, giving everybody the same to succeed. Then the last question uh, was a little more difficult for some to answer, including myself, but is why don't we discuss this more often? Why don't we discuss diversity and inclusion? And we came up with one fear. People aren't comfortable doing it. And sometimes it's just easier not to talk about it. Uh, we ended with, you know, what can town, the Cary Board of Commission do to be better in this? And if anybody has any suggestions, uh, Deputy Town Clerk Julie Clifton would be interested in hearing from you. That's what I got from it, Dan. Don, I appreciate that summation because it was, uh, you know, we were only we only met for an hour, just so the folks know. So, and, and True did a great job facilitating uh, and walking us through those questions, as, as, as Don mentioned. Um, and having a discussion about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, the definitions, and, and the barriers of why we're not, you know, why they're not part of the conversation. We also ended at the end was, you know, more asking from a board level, you know, what what impact, what how how do we involve uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? And so we had a brief discussion at the end about board selection. Uh, staff uh, talked about, you know, an effort to make an outreach to uh, uh, populations uh, uh, by various uh, demographics, uh, cultural, race, et cetera, geographic. Um, so there was an effort to, to be able to, because we just had gone through recently, and this was in June. And so the town was still seeking applications to serve on all the town boards. Uh, that application period ended in June, June 30th. So it was an outreach effort that they talked about. Uh, some board members talked about some other things that could be done. Um, you know, I uh, won't get into that. I think also there was a brief discussion about, you know, boards being, you know, mindful of issues regarding diversity, equity, inclusion, and decisions that are made and how that may impact and how 
whether it be you know the, the an advisory role that you know things that we could advise on or just be thinking about policies that come before us for discussion and asking that question of, uh, of how how will this help our community and maybe there's some stakeholders at the table whose voices aren't necessarily being heard but make sure that all perspectives may be able to be uh, taken into consideration and be able to provide some feedback to staff. So, I was I was very happy to be there. I think it's uh, I think it um, you know I think that last part. Why don't we include it more? I think this becomes part of a the ongoing conversation, and hopefully it's not one and done. I appreciate the town reaching out to the board, and I appreciate the ongoing. Um, Effort the town has made uh, in this area with staff. Um, I, I know, and Don could probably speak to this better than I can. I know that this really started with a conversation that the true had with uh, for the former chief of police that has carried on to even now to work on this issue, um, not only within the police department, but across all, all sections of, of uh, the town government. And um, so, uh, any any questions or comments from from the board on this? We were asked to come back and share, and that's uh, that's that's what we have to share. Um, will there be future um, opportunities to uh, participate in a conversation like that as a board representative? I don't know what the follow up is going to be. I don't know if Deborah is aware of anything as a follow up. Well, we will let you know certainly if we um if we learn of those. Thank you. You know, we'll we'll pass on to the clerk's office that there was some interest expressed. So, I I think that's great. Um, I'll keep you posted if we learn more about it because I know other board members have asked that as well. So thank you for raising that. Yeah, sure. Um, just on a personal, thank you, Don, um, and Dan for uh, reporting back to us. I, I remember. Hearing about True and his work with the Cary Police Department, I think I listened to it on the radio, um, and I was very impressed with um, just the way that he had he had ha reacted to something that happened in the Cary community and and wanted to have a conversation. And I also really appreciate that we live in a place where the town is very interested in having these conversations with people in the community. So I I think. Why don't we talk more about it? Let's keep talking about it if we can, um, if we have those opportunities. So um, anyway, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Sure, you're welcome. And uh, thank you Deborah, for bringing that back to the town clerk's office about the interest. And I would encourage any of you, if you ever have an opportunity to either listen to True Pettigrew or attend any of his sessions. Uh, I know he did a session for the uh, uh, Martin Luther King Day weekends uh, activities uh, with town staff. Um, you know, it, it's worthwhile. He has a, a, he has a great perspective and um, uh, I think he's, you know, he's looking to for positive change and you know and working working within the the town and the institutions here so if there's nothing else i don't believe we have any other business uh we'll hear from staff regarding where we'll be meeting in for august uh whether it'll be virtually or in person um so stay tuned to that uh, check your email and if there's nothing else coming before us, uh, I will call for adjournment and thank you for being here tonight and participating in tonight's meeting and I will hereby call the meeting adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. All right. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye.